Hi, you guys. Welcome, welcome. Na dobro pajalovat. My name is Samantha Rogers. Today is Friday, and we have another true crime stories with Sal. Today's case, I'm going to do it pretty much the same way I did my previous case, where I actually will be naming uh, the victims' uh, true identity and their real names, and also same as the perpetrator. Uh, I chose to do so because. This, uh, after this tragic story, uh, our victim in this case survived and very bravely she had been speaking out on her orde ordeal. So I figured that I uh, will mention her name and will show pictures just like I did the previous case because cases like this where the victim actually survived and chose to go public with their um, horrific ordeal I feel like you know it's no need for me to uh, keep their names private cases like this I would not uh, choose to you know uh, seal their identity what have you but I do want to warn that this case uh, is pretty uh, horrific and I will be showing a few photos that might be a little bit too much for some viewers Quick disclaimer, this case uh, is about a possible murder, a very horrific murder towards uh, children uh, and uh, abuse. So if this is something that you don't want to look at today or hear about today, especially the children part, abuse of uh, murder uh, of children, and also the photos about to show you, it's... Um, pretty graphic uh, so just the warning uh, if this is something you can't handle today totally understand your well-being is everything so take care of yourself and you can always come back to it later or I hope I see you in another video so without any further ado let's get into today's case Today's case is taking place in Sweden, in Arboga, and this is a Swedish-German case. And for those of you that lived in Sweden in 2007 and 2008, or even in Germany, uh, I'm pretty sure you heard of this case, because this case was in every single newspaper, on the TV, in the news. This was like as huge as the Gabby Petito case. So definitely all my Swedish viewers and uh, European viewers, German viewers, you definitely know uh, what I'm gonna about to tell you guys. We are going to discuss the deranged woman by the name of Christine. She's a German woman and uh, this case took place in uh, 2007 in Arboga in Sweden and it was on March 17 and at this time Christine was around her early 30s uh, around 31, 32 years old. To understand this case a little bit better, but of course not justify anything of Christine's actions because they're not uh, rational actions at all, uh, we have to go back in the story. So Christine was born on June 30th, 1976 in Germany and around seven years old, her father left the family, so she uh, kind of like lost contact with the dad, so she was raised by her mother. I don't know, I'm not sure if she had any other sibling. Uh, I couldn't find that in my research. And during her um, uh, childhood, it was seemingly normal childhood, nothing particular happened to Christine. The father uh, abandoning the family, that's like pretty much the only traumatizing experience that Christine experienced. In her later years, Christine actually traveled a lot. She was a au pair in uh, the US. She came to Washington, worked as an au pair, and then she kind of like moved around here in the US, and, to, and then she moved back to Germany to study. After a few years in Germany, she felt like travel again, and she this time settled down in Greece. And I believe she worked for this tourist firm uh, in Greece, 
and uh, she kind of like went back and forth from Greece to Germany and she settled down in Crete. At this point, Christine is working in Crete as uh, she's working for this hostel. And for those of you that don't know what a hostel is, it's kind of like a hotel, motel type of situation. A lot of foreign people that visit the country stays there. I don't know if you've seen that horror movie uh, actually called Ho or named Hostel. So you should definitely check it out if you like like gory horror movies. It's very good. I think it's like five of them. Kind of like Saw almost type of like genre, if you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, so she worked at this hostel, and that's when she met a Swedish man. His name is Torgny. And Torgny came to Crete uh, for vacation, and he was there, I believe, for two weeks. Very popular and still is for a lot of Swedish people to uh, visit Crete uh, during the summer. And during that summer of 2006, that's exactly what Torgny did. He was there for vacation, and that's how he met Christine. And according to Torgny, this was, so he was there for two weeks, and uh, this was just a five-day fling, uh, a very heated five-day fling with Christine. And, uh, you know, they ch uh, by the end of his uh, vacation, they exchanged numbers so they could keep, keep contact when he's back in Sweden. According to Torgny, this was nothing serious. He clearly knew that this is just the summer fling, uh, this woman is not even living in Sweden. He was not looking for a serious long distance relationship. So he kind of like, you know, had fun, did his thing, and that was that. But definitely not what Christine thought of this fling. She became madly in love to the point that she was literally obsessed with this man. And she, you know, called him, emailed him, texted him pretty much every day. And, you know, at this point, Torgny's kind of like, you know, keep up with the, with the contact with Christine. Again, he's not looking for anything serious. In his mind, this is just something friendly, you know, to kind of like keep in touch with the woman that he uh, had fun with in, in, in Greece, in Crete. And that's that. During this long distance contact between, um, about to say Greece, <laughs> between uh, Christine and Torgny, uh, Christine actually visited Torgny back in Arboga in Sweden. She visited him a few times, I believe two or three times. And after the last visit, Torgny actually felt like, okay, she um, is not the woman for him, or he already knew that. But at this point, he felt like, you know what, I just want to cut all communications with her. I don't even want to have like a long distance thing with her, not even a friendship. I'm done. Torgny sent a text message to Christine, pretty much breaking up with her, even though they were not exclusive like that, according to Torgny. So basically, he's texting her, telling her that, uh, you know, like, I'm done. Uh, I don't think this is working out or, you know, whatever. I don't know exactly the context of his text, but I'm assuming it's some it, long lines of you know, I'm done, have a good life, goodbye. As you guys can imagine, Christine didn't take this well at all. She called Torgny an idiot, how dare he breaking her heart like this, that she'd been throwing up ever since she got that text from him. He made her sick now, and uh, she just like blaming him for every bad thing that ever happened to her after she received that text from him. And this was very uh, kind of like shocking to Torgny. I mean, he understood, he felt like, yes, she was maybe more in love with him than he was in her. But at the same time, he felt like she was on the same level of understanding that this was just a casual thing. They never were exclusive. He never introduced her as her girl girlfriend. So he was very shocked uh, to see her aggression like this and the way she reacted. A few months later, uh, Torgny and Christine decided to meet up in Sweden one more time. And because I think also Torgny felt a little bad about the whole situation, how he broke up with her or ended things through a text. So I feel like that was also for him to kind of like have a normal closure and like you know face to face uh with this woman so 
he, uh, so she, Christine uh, flew over to Sweden uh, for the last time to see Torgny, and I think she spent uh, three days with him. And at the end, according to Torgny, she, you know, flew back to Germany, nothing like no drama, nothing happened. But after the last visit, Christine started to emailing Torgny that she has contemplated to take her own life. She doesn't want to live anymore. And that she also was pregnant with his child, which was not true. It was fake. She was never pregnant. And at this point, Torgny just really had enough with Christine and her shenanigans. So he was just text her back saying that, leave me alone. I have a family now. I have a girlfriend now. I'm not interested in you. Leave me alone. For you and me uh, sitting here listening to the story, or when I heard this a story for the for case for the first time, we're thinking like, okay, wow, you know, I hope, I mean, now she would probably understand, like, he has another girl, he has a family now, like, uh, she better leave this man alone. Or like, if it was me, I mean, it would never go to that low that I would kill myself over someone like that. But, you know, like, at this point, you feel like, okay, he moved on, time for me to move on. But no, Christine, she, what, did, what, did, what do you guys think she decided to do? Well, she decided to move to Sweden. Yeah. So, you know, her pathetic plea for him to stay with her, that she's now pregnant, that she's going to commit suicide or what have you, didn't work. So this woman packs her bag and moved to Stockholm, Sweden. And while living in Stockholm, Sweden, Christine actually was admitted to the psychiatric ward twice for her trying to commit suicide. She had superficial wound, cutting wounds on her uh, wrists. According to the doctors at the psychiatric ward, uh, they, Christine was telling them that uh, she was going through a very rough breakup with her boyfriend that he basically broke up with her and she's very, very depressed over it. And that's why she started cutting herself. This brings us now to the timeline uh, of March of 2007. So Christine actually visited the home of Torgny and his new girlfriend, Emma, and uh, their two children, one-year-old Saga, and three-year-old Maximilian, he, or Max as they called him. And these two children was not Torgny's biological children. This was uh, two ch the two children that Emma had with her previous husband. I couldn't find how Christine found out where, where Emma and Torgny stayed, uh, but I believe she probably was uh, spying on them because According to my research, she was actually at Emma's uh, and Torgny's uh, villa three times that March. I believe it was on March 12, 14, and 16. And uh, the, according to uh, Torgny, these three dates, um, they could kind of like hear strange noises coming from outside sometimes and, you know, throughout the house. So there was like strange noises throughout the house and outside during those three dates. And now we know that that was the time that Christine visited them unannounced and probably, uh, I'm assuming, because I mean, you about to want to tell you what happened next, you probably agree with me, that she was basically kind of like spying on them and kind of like learning about their schedule, who is home, when, who is leaving for work or what have you. So around 7 p.m. ish, so 7.20, 7.30-ish on March 17th, Emma is at home with her two children and she gets a knock on her door. And I believe that they, uh, Emma and her children were the only ones at the house. I don't think Torgny or I don't, I couldn't find it. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they were by themselves and Torgny was either at work or somewhere else. When Emma opens the door, it's Christine, and Christine is holding a hammer. And without any words of exchange or anything, Christine attacks Emma, and she gets 15, 15 blows to her right side of her head. 
And at this point, Emma is unconscious on the floor. She's bleeding out from her head profusely. She has 15 puncture wounds in her skull from a hammer. And Christine was not done with that. And she proceeds to attack the kids. So she first attacked Max, three-year-old Max, the boy. Uh, she hit him in the head. I don't know exactly how many times, but according to the autopsy photos, uh, which are s online, which is actually, uh, yeah, you can Google them if you want. I'm not going to put them on, but, uh, but yeah, they are online. But according to, it was more than six blows to his head. Uh, one research that I found, I'm not quite sure if it's true, but during this commotion, the one-year-old Saga, the girl, uh, she uh, ran away in the house to hide. So if this is true, this is like a little brave girl that she understood that this is danger. She's just one-year-old, and she tempted to run away and hide. But of course, Christine found her, and she hit her in the head with the hammer as well. And according to the sources that I could find, she actually uh, was viciously, uh, more brutally attacked. I don't know, like, you know, 15 blows to the head or, you know, six or seven blows to the little a boy's head is vicious enough. But apparently, according to the sources, she attacked poor Saga even more viciously. She kind of like took all, took all of her anger out of this poor little one-year-old girl. When Christine was done, she left the house like nothing happened and disappeared into the night. And according to, again, some sources was saying that uh, Emma at this point woke up and she called the ambulance herself. And in another video that I'm actually going to link in the description, uh, you could hear on the 911 call, it's a man's voice. So I'm assuming Torgny came home at some point, found Emma, and called the 911. So it's unclear if it was Emma calling or Torgny and Emma. So just, you know, take it as that. But either way, uh, unfortunately, the children was pronounced dead at the scene, and Emma was rushed to the hospital where she actually stayed in a coma uh, for 10 days. Days. And here's the part where I'm going to insert Emma's uh, hospital photo. So just again, uh, they're very graphic. And for those that are afraid of photos like this, uh, I would suggest just look away. I will tell you when they're off and on the screen. So I'm going to put the first photo now. This is Emma. Uh, I believe she's still in her coma. And this is the more graphic photo. So this is the graphic photo of, of her injuries. And as you guys can see, it's, yeah. Okay, the photo is off. You guys can look back if you were, were looking away. The photo is out of the screen. So as you guys can see, if can you just imagine, this is a grown or 20-plus woman. And uh, she suffered 15 uh, blows to her head with a hammer. And you guys can just imagine how those poor children... Um, their autopsy photos, which is which are online, and I feel like that should not be. But yeah, when Emma woke up ten days later from her coma, uh, the police and the detectives they felt like they didn't want to break the news of her children right, like right after you know she woke up because she was still recovering her mem. She lost a, quite a while, a, quite a good chunk of her memory. And she was, of course, she didn't know what was what happened to her. She she didn't know why where she was. And <clears throat> at the documentary that I saw, which is in Swedish, and I will link it below for those that speak Swedish um, can watch it. But it's very interesting. It's called it's the Kalafakta uh, Cold Fact, if I pronounce it uh, from translated from Swedish to English. It's basically a documentary that is in Sweden that talks about cases like this and a bunch of other stuff. Very interesting. And in this uh, Kalafakta documentary, uh, you can see the recovery process of Emma. Uh, it didn't, they didn't tell her about her children, I believe, a month into her recovery process when they slowly kind of like told her what happened to the kids and that they're no longer alive. 
And even then, Emma didn't believe them. She thought that they just like, you know, hiding the kids from her and that they tell her this so she can kind of like, you know, and I don't know, her brain was not just properly absorbing the information, you know, that her children was no longer alive. So the police turn their suspect to the, uh, to their suspicion on the ex-husband. They arrested Emma's ex-husband uh, uh, for on the suspicion of this uh, brutal attack, because interviewing Emma's family, her dad and uh, her friends, her ex-husband was a uh, uh, had a you know aggressive temper, and he could easily lash out on Emma. And I think also on a few occasions. He actually, uh, you know, beat her, and that was one of the reasons why she divorced him. But after a while, Emma's father, you know, uh, when he heard more and more of the details of what really happened, he felt like uh, the ex-husband is was not was guilty because even though he was aggressive towards Emma, but he loved his children. He would never ever do something horrible like that to the children. So Emma's father kind of talked to the police about, you might have the wrong guy. Another friend of Emma and the ex-husband, so the mutual friend, it's, uh, I forgot her name was a woman, Mickey's. Her name was Mickey's, now it came to me. So Mickey's is a mutual friend to Emma and the ex-husband. And according to Mickey's, yes, she kind of like, you know, agreed with Emma's father that even though the ex-husband was aggressive and he had a hot temper from time to time, he never laid his hand. He never so screamed at his children. He loved them unconditionally. And this could not be him that would do this to Emma and the children. And at this point, Emma's memory starts slowly but surely, uh, kind of like, you know, come to her. And she starts talking about this woman, this woman that her now boyfriend, Torgny, was uh, seeing. And she kept saying this German woman. First, she said foreign woman. She couldn't really say uh, tell what country. But then she starts saying this German woman. Now the police had another suspect. And uh, they start interviewing Torgny, ask him about this woman. And he basically told him that, yes, he had a brief fling two years ago or a year and a half ago with this uh, German woman that he met in Greece. It was nothing serious, but according to this woman, she was more obsessed with him than he was of her and basically told the police everything that from the emails, from her threatening her life, from her being pregnant and what have you. The police also proceeded to check the surveillance cameras and Lord and behold, what do you know, Christine was captured uh, going into this uh, airport, a small little airport outsk outside uh, outskirts of Stockholm, uh, boarding a plane to Germany. And she was spotted going in. And here you can see I circled the red circle. She's kind of like, you know, by, with the crowd mingling, waiting to departure, basically. According to Christine's German friend, she said that Christine joking, joking, jokingly, oh my God, jokingly said to her that she threw the murder weapon which was the hammer in a trash container at the airport right before the security check but since this was already months uh, pra after the attack and after christine fleeing sweden they couldn't not locate this hammer even though if this was true that christine got rid of the hammer in a trash uh, container Again, the hammer was never found, so they didn't have the murder weapon. In 2008, the trial began for Christine, and of course, Emma was the star witness. Even though one uh, doctor that apparently is this specialist on memory loss and uh, comas and what have you, he testified or against Emma's uh, testimony and basically said that during her condition and what she been through, there's no possible way that she could remember vividly who attacked her. And kind of like blamed it that maybe Emma was, you know, uh, giving all of these memories because of her family, that they were maybe like talking to her about this woman and what have you. 
But mind you that after Emma was released from the hospital, they actually moved her to a secluded location. No one knew where she was. She was like, if she was with family, they had police presence. So it's like, so it's not like she just went by, went home again and lived her life like, you know, like nothing happened. She was basically, they did this so she could kind of like regain the memories of her, like for her, like on her own and not have them planned by the family members. Despite all of that, they, uh, the jury found Christine guilty, of course. I mean, who wouldn't? And she got life, but of course, as you guys already know from my previous Swedish cases, life in Sweden is 10 to 15 years. Uh, she was also, um, after, her, after she served her time, they deported Christine back to Germany and she basically can never, ever, ever enter Sweden ever again. Like she's basically banned from Sweden her whole life. She can never, ever enter Sweden. As far as Emma and Torgny, they actually still together, uh, believe it or not. They're still together, which is beautiful throughout all of this. And uh, so Torgny, of course, he suffered a lot of guilt after this because he felt like, you know, this was all because of him, that he brought this lunatic woman into his family, like his new relationship. Emma it is... Uh, of course, not blaming Torgny at all, but, and she also takes this, um, you know, kind of well. I mean, again, you never know what people go through behind closed doors. She could smile and talk happy on, in front of the cameras, but you never know what she, what happens to her inside. But according to this interview I saw of her back in 2018, so recent interview, she basically still cannot take a shower or have her eyes closed and no one is at home. Like, so she had to, if she takes a shower and she has to like rinse her hair or to close her eyes, Torgny has to sit uh, uh, like next to her. So he has to be there because she doesn't like to lose the control of not knowing what's going on or what's happening. And Torgny and Emma has two children of their own right now. Uh, I believe it's a girl and a boy. A lot of people also criticize Emma for not showing emotions on her interviews. She kind of looked happy and smiling. Uh, even though she went through this horrible ordeal and losing her kids and what have you and almost lost her own life. But according to Emma, uh, she, you know, feel like every time she speaks of the children, she wants to remember the happy memories. Uh, fortunately, she haven't seen the autopsy photos that are lurking online and she's happy about that because she doesn't want to have that image of her children, which I totally understand. And uh, so she just remembers them like as they were happy, you know, uh, crazy kids, you know, that always danced and laughed and make noises. So that's why every time she talks about them, she's in a good mood and a good spirit instead of just breaking down and crying. So my darlings, that was it for today's case. Uh, again, let me know if you heard of it for my Swedish and European people. I'm sure you have. Like I said, if you were in Sweden or anywhere in Europe in 2007 and 8, you definitely heard of this story. For those that haven't, let me know what you guys think. And I felt like it was very important to bring the story up because I know it's so many stories like this, but uh, the man is a perpetrator. Like the man gets obsessed with the woman, he beats her, he kills her, what have you. But this time it was actually a woman and I feel like it's very interesting. So. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, people can uh, get obsessed and, you know, commit this horrible crime. And one thing that I also forgot to mention is like, uh, speaking of being happy, the photos that I found of Christine in court, she was smiling. She didn't look like she was at all uh, sad or disturbed or any like remorse of what she done. She looked happy, nonchalant, like nothing of this bothered her. Like, so what? I just killed two innocent kids. So what? And I also think, um, or this is according to my research, we don't know 100% sure, but the reason why Christine killed those poor little kids is I think she thought that those kids were, uh, Torgny's kids. So, um, uh, be, uh, according to the sources, we don't know if, if she knew that these kids were Emma's kids with another man. They might be alive, but according to the source that I read, 
they believe that Christine thought that these were the Tor Torgny's and Emma's uh, children. So that's why she committed this act. But no matter what, I mean, killing innocent kids for a D, I don't want to say that word because I don't know. I mean, I curse, so I don't know. But yeah, killing someone at all, a kid, child, person for a D, you have to be the most pathetic, literally like loser, psychopath in the world like come on there's so many plenty of d's out there like you can get one you know oh my god i don't understand people like that i call them tapachki women if you know you know tapachki means um shoe or chancla in, in spanish so basically some doormat if you under, if you <laughs> translate but someone that is basically pathetic crying over someone that doesn't want them so please don't be a tapachki woman or a tapachki man if you know plenty of fish in the sea this person is not for you don't risk your own life don't lose your own life or ruin your own life for someone that doesn't want you you know please okay my darlings enough ranting from me i hope you guys stay safe if you leave comments make sure they are respectful if you are about to comment towards these people, the case. And as always, you know, about to say, take care of yourself. Don't be a top chicky person. Love yourself first, and then you can love others, you know. And again, if someone doesn't want you, just tell God bless them, move on. Life is far more precious than chasing someone that don't want you, okay? Or ruining your life, ruining others' life for someone that doesn't want you. I hope you guys enjoy this case. Let me know what you think. Thank you guys for spending time this Friday evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time it is at your place. And I hope I see you guys in the next one. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Cheers. Ciao, cacao.